process of perception. Perception is the process of making meaning from the things we experience in our environment. And we, when we apply this process, this perception process, to the people as well as relationships, we engage in interpersonal perception. We're involved in interpersonal sorry, in interpersonal perception constantly. Uh, your mind usually selects, organizes, and interprets information so quickly and so subconsciously that you may think your perceptions are objective. They're factual reflections of the world. Selection, organization, and interpretation are the three basic stages of perception. Now let's look at each one of these in order. Selection, what we choose to pay attention to. The process of perception begins when one or more of our senses is stimulated. You pass a construction site, for example, and you hear two people talking about the foundation they're pouring. You see one of your classmates smile at you. Maybe a coworker bumps into you. Uh, but you only notice these sensory perceptions of hearing, seeing, and being bumped when you can then initiate your process of forming those perceptions. Rather than paying attention to all the stimuli in your environment, Uh, you, what you're doing is you engage in selection, the process of so, in which your mind and body help you choose only certain stimuli to attend to. Next, organization. Organization is how we classify that stimulus. Once you've noticed a particular stimulus, the next step in the process is to classify it. This task is called organization. Organization helps you make sense of the information by revealing how it is similar to or different from other things you know about. Next is interpretation. What meaning we assigned to the stimulus. Now, after noticing and classifying the stimulus, you have to assign it to uh, you have to assign it an interpretation to figure out what it means to you. That doesn't necessarily mean the process is always linear. However, the three stages of perception, selecting, organizing, and interpreting information, do overlap. How we interpret a behavior depends on what we notice about it, for example, but what we notice can also depend on the way we, we interpret it. Now, importantly, uh, we don't necessarily make conscious decisions about which stimulus to notice and which to ignore. Rather, as the research indicates, Three characteristics especially make a particular stimulus more likely to be selected or attained or paid attention to. First, is it an unusual or unexpected stimulus? This is the kind that will stand out. A loud noise, some shocking visual. Second, repetition or how frequently you're exposed to, to how frequently you are exposed to a stimulus makes it stand out as well. And third, the intensity of the stimulus, obviously, very unusual and intense, makes it stand out as well. Makes you take makes you take, makes you take notice of it. Now we use these four types or schema to classify information we notice about other people. We notice their role constructs, their physical constructs, interaction constructs, and psychological constructs. First. The first schema that we use to classify information we notice about other people, I'm not saying stereotype, is the physical constructs. These emphasize people's appearance, causing us to notice objective characteristics such as height, age, ethnicity, body shape, as well as subjective characteristics such as physical attractiveness. Role characteristics emphasize a person's social or professional position. So we notice that a person is a is a is it an adjunct professor, an adjunct instructor? Is a teacher, maybe they're an accountant, a doctor, a cop, a father, a community leader, and so on. Interaction constructs is another schema that we use to classify people. It emphasizes people's behavior. So we notice that a person is outgoing, they're aggressive, they're shy, they're sarcastic, or maybe they are considerate. And then finally, your psychological constructs. These emphasize people's thoughts and feelings, causing us to perceive that a person is angry. Maybe they're self-assured, insecure, insecure, envious, or, or maybe worried. Now, what are some of the influences on our interpretation? Uh, for, fairly straightforward. These are not nearly as complicated. What influences our perception 
on the interpret what influences what we interpret is the experiences we've had in the past or expect to have going forward with the other person, what we know about the other person, and the closeness of the relationship with the, with the person. These three things, when taken together, are, have dramatic influence into, in terms of how we interpret the inter, how we interpret uh, our relationship and our process of interpreting information from that other person. Now, because we constantly make perceptions, not saying stereotypes, you might think we're all but experts at it by now. But the truth is, perceptual, not saying stereotypes, mistakes are often easy to make. Now, there are three factors in particular that influence the accuracy of our perceptions and lead to errors. Our physiology, our culture, and co-cultural backgrounds and our social norms. Now, I've jokingly said a few times that I'm not saying stereotypes, that this is a way to kind of reprogram and reevaluate what we think we know about stereotypes. The first is physical states uh, and traits. The physical states and traits are, 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 are conditions that are temporary. Another powerful influence on the accuracy of our perceptions of others is the culture and co-culture which we identify with. Cultural values and norms have many, many different effects on the way we communicate interpersonally, in addition to affecting our behavior. Culture also influences our perceptions and interpretations of other people's behavior. And then finally, our social role is a set of behaviors that are expected of someone in a particular social interaction. Now, in our text, the researcher has done a really good job uh, documenting and writing up some great articles and great, uh, great, great uh, inclusions in the text that find that physically attractive men were perceived to communicate on as kinder, more intelligent, more confident, and in more humorous ways compared to their, their less attractive counterparts, parts, those poor roots. This finding illustrates how visual cues can affect people's perceptions of what they read, which is important in the online dating context. Think about Tinder. Don't think about Tinder. Tinder. If you don't know what that is, don't Google it. Because users do not always describe themselves accurately in their profiles. Shocker. I'm sure you're shocked by that. You're thinking to yourself, I'm so glad I sat through this class. I would not have known that users do not always describe themselves accurately. I, I'm, thank you, Dr. Burns. It is useful to be aware of how readers' perceptions can be swayed. Oh, that's a great article. It's because she's hot. It's a great article. That's a great profile. That's a great you know, Tinder profile, whatever. It's a great Match.com profile uh, because they're so hot. That's a, great, that's a great article because they're attractive. Even if somebody wrote the greatest and most accurate profile ever, if they were lacking in attractiveness, we would not ascribe as good of qualities or characteristics to that person. Now, an another thing that, that, that influences uh, our interpersonal perceptions of others is this thing called the primacy recency effect. And I know you've heard this in, in many other contexts before. You remember the first few things you, you've heard, and you remember the last few things you've heard. If I gave you a list of numbers, or if I gave you a, a gro literally a grocery list of things you, ha you have to pick up at, uh, at, at, at Walmart or Target, uh, you would remember the first, I don't know, two or three things, and the last two or three things, and everything in the middle you'd forget. And I also give that advice when I, uh, when I do my public speaking course and my, my, my public speaking uh, uh, consulting is, if you're in a public speaking course, if you have the option, uh, don't go first uh, or second or third or fourth. And don't wait to go last because everybody in the room is going to remember the first couple people and the last couple people. Go in the middle. If there are 20 people in the class, be number 10. Uh, and the same thing with, with the speech that you're writing. Your first point and your last point should be your best points. Your point that's not that good, put that in the middle. But that's that's really a public speaking concept. As it relates to interpersonal, uh, our first impressions of someone seem to really stick in our mind more than our second impression, third impression, fourth impression, or first and fourth meeting. Uh, e why is that? Okay, egocentrism. That's one of them. Another, I'm sorry. Another component or force in our interpersonal. Uh, interpersonal paradigm here is the egocentric quality and that's the ability to take another person's perspective are, or are we so wrapped up in our own worldview uh, that we can't even see 
myopic? Can we not even see past our own blinders? Or do we have empathy and a, are we less than ego-centered or have a less, uh, less focus on the centered ego of self that we're able to put ourselves, so to speak, in other people's shoes? Next is the positivity bias. The positivity bias causes us to perceive information in an overly idealistic way. We want to simplify things and explain things in a simple, simple way because it helps us understand them. Conversely, the negativity bias leads us to view information in an overly pessimistic way. These are two counter, uh, counterbalancing effects that, that influence our interpersonal perceptions of others. Next, explaining what we perceive. This is a really, really good concept that I think a lot of you are going to identify with. People have an almost constant need to make sense of the world. It's not enough to just notice when someone's behavior, for instance. We also want to figure out why did they do that? Okay, why did that happen? The first thing we look at is locus of control. Not locus like a little bug, but locus, L-O-C-U-S refers to where the location, where the cause of behavior is located, whether within ourselves or outside. Some of, some of our behaviors do have internal causes, which means they're caused by characteristics about us. It's, we act that way because that's who we are. Other behaviors have external causes, meaning they're caused by something outside of ourselves. A second dimension of attribution is whether the cause of behavior is stable or unstable. A stable cause is one that is permanent, semi-permanent, or at least not easily changed. Finally, causes of behavior, controllability, also vary in how controllable they are. If you make a controllable attribution for someone's behavior, then you believe that cause of the behavior was under that person's control, under that person's locus of control. In contrast, an uncontrollable attribution identifies a cause outside that person's control. Now, here's a great concept. We might always think, that we explain behavior in an objective, rational way. But the truth is that we're all prone to taking mental shortcuts, A to B, when coming up with attributions to what do we attribute other people's as well as our behavior. As a result, our attributions are often less accurate than they should be. I'll give you some good examples here in a minute. Three of the most common attribution errors are the self-serving bias, the fundament, fundamental attribution error and over attribution. Let's see where my notes are. Fundamental attribution error influences the accuracy. The self serving bias, let me go back to the self serving bias. I'm sorry, I jumped ahead of myself. The self serving bias refers to uh, what it means is our tendency to attribute our success to stable internal causes while attributing our failures to unstable external causes. Uh, I get in a car wreck. It's not that I'm a terrible driver. I'd never say that about myself. It's because it was raining. For example, another example, if you get an annual test, if you get an annual test on all these, in all your courses, you did so because you're smart. But if you got an F, it's because the test was unfair. Or you had to work late the night before. Or the professor was a total jackass. That's why. That's why you got an F on the test. It's his or her fault. These attributions are called self-serving because they suggest that our success is deserved, but our failures are not deserved or not our fault. Now, why do we do this? Think about it for a second. We do this to protect our ego. Next, the reason that our responses is, uh, the reason for that type of response is that we can contribute, this is what is called the fundamental attribution error. The reason we do this in which is, is the error uh, in which we attribute other people's behaviors to internal rather than, than external behavior. So somebody cuts in line. I'll give you a good example. Go to Walmart. Go to Target. Go to whatever, whatever grocery store you shop at. And you want to go to the express checkout lane. It's 20 items. Somebody gets in front of you with clearly not 20, 30, 40. You are going to attribute that they are raging, you know what? They're idiots. How would you dare, how do you dare, get in front of all of us uh, who have 15 items, 10 items, 5 out of 5 items? I'm just here to get a loaf of bread. 
you're going to get in the in this the, uh, accessory accessory you're going to get in the speed checkout lane the express checkout lane with 30 items because you're an idiot but if you did it oh i'm in a hurry okay i i got i got a hurry or i didn't see that sign or you know it's only 22 items and i'm going to count some of these things is one because they're kind of the same thing. The milk and the yogurt are both dairy, so they're really just one. Okay. You attribute your sneaking into that line as an accident. You didn't notice. But when somebody else does it, they're a flawed guy. Next, a third common attribution error is over-attribution in which we single out one or two obvious characteristics of a person and then attribute everything he or she does to those characteristics. Now, we have examined a lot of really interesting concepts here and, and looked at how easy it is to make these perceptual types of mistakes. We, we stereotype people. That's the word I was jokingly saying. We're not talking about stereotypes, but now we can say that some of the mistakes we make come down to the extent to which we stereotype people. We assume they think the ways, I'm sorry, we assume that they think the same ways we do. We attribute all of the behavior to one or two characteristics. Now, clearly, uh, perception making is hard work. Now, on the positive side, despite all of those limitations, we could do better uh, if we knew how and if we tried. And tr improving our perceptual ability starts with being mindful. Ta -da! Being mindful uh, about how we perceive others. Next, it involves checking the accuracy of perceptions. But how do you do that? Let's look at that real quick. How do we do that? First, know your own biases. As we've seen, the reason that our individual characteristics often shape the way we perceive situations is we need to be mindful of our perceptions. Therefore, ask yourself, how are they influenced by your personal attributes? Next, number two, focus on other people's positive characteristics. Being mindful of our perceptions also means acknowledging how they are influenced by characteristics of the people we're perceiving. And then finally, the last step in being mindful of your perceptions is to consider how the context, the checkout lane at Walmart or Target, the express checkout lane, how did that context influence your perception? Now, the practice part of checking your perceptions is uh, comes down to generating alternative perceptions because it's important for a couple reasons. First, it requires you to look at information about the situation that doesn't match your original perception. And it also involves, sorry, and it also involves a direct perception check, which means you simply ask other people if your perception if a situation is correct. Did I see that happen? Am I analyzing that correctly? Am I thinking about this the right way? That is a direct perception checking activity. And finally, good communicators, because we're always talking about communication competence in this course. Use what they learn from perception checking to modify perceptions of a situation. Sometimes you'll find that your perceptions were accurate from the start. Other times you'll realize they were very flawed for many of the reasons that we've considered so far. They were possibly limited by the characteristics of yourself. They were limited by the characteristics of the people involved, or they were limited by the characteristics of the situation. Possibly you were confusing facts and interpretations, or finally, you just didn't consider any alternative perceptions. Thank you for watching Process of Perception.